The Unshackled Waves, Episode 76. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, here for this week's review episode, and I'm joined once again by my co-editor-in-chief of The Unshackled, Zuka Fernando. Welcome again. Thanks, Tim, and hello, everyone. It's been another busy news week. Uh, We learned this week that uh, Australia will finally be getting a plebiscite on same-sex marriage, though it will only be a voluntary postal one. Uh, The Liberal Party at their party room meeting uh, last Monday, uh, reaffirmed its commitment to hold a plebiscite on the issue of same-sex marriage. It was pleasing to see they didn't cave in to uh, the mainstream media campaign and the leftist lobbying and adopt a free vote, which shows that Liberal Party at least does something right. Also, higher electricity prices are still a big issue in Australia, with now many Australians in energy poverty. Uh, uh, the government had a uh, meeting this week with energy suppliers and they, they claim that the way to solve this crisis is certainty over the clean energy target. Uh, but of course, uh, the real way we could uh, stop rising power prices is if we just stop this climate madness. Uh, Sydney's Martin Place has become occupied by a group of alleged homeless people setting up a tent city. Uh, They've refused the state government's offer of assistance and we've later learnt that many of them aren't really that poor after all. So it's really been exposed as just another leftist stunt to, you know, whack conservatives and mean right-wingers. Trump and North Korea have dialed up the the rhetoric. Both are threatening to nuke each other. Uh, A lot of commentators are now saying this situation is getting quite serious, even though uh, North Korea has been a rogue state for uh, decades now. Um, But should we be really worried about this latest rhetoric is probably the point worth discussing. But we'll start with or what probably is the big news of the week, which is the uh, same-sex marriage uh, plebiscite. So as I said, like there was a huge, pu- we discussed it last week, a huge push by uh, gay liberals, uh, uh, members of parliament, along with a few others, to have a free vote to break their election commitment to hold a plebiscite. But at their party room meeting on Monday, only seven liberals voted to, to ditch the plebiscite, which was pretty hilarious, the, the, the fact that despite all the media pressure, they, uh, only seven voted to change the policy. Now, they put the plebiscite legislation again to the Senate this week. It was rejected. Uh, so now they are going ahead with a postal plebiscite, which will be non-compulsory uh, conducted by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Uh, it'll cost uh, $122 million and we'll, we'll know the results by November 15th. Uh, same-sex marriage advocates are still uh, they're challenging the, uh, the government's ability to conduct this plebiscite, saying it exceeds the Bureau of Statistics authority. So they're, they're still fighting it uh, every step of the way, but at least we've finally got, got there now. The Australian people are going to have their say. Yeah, I think if you live in a democracy, then you need to face the fact that you, know, you will be subject to other people's votes. You will be subject to democratic procedures, um, you know, whether you like it or not. But I think um, this entire argument used by the left, used by the LGBT community, saying that this plebiscite will result in rampant homophobia, will result in um, all these offensive things that will see a spike in LGBT youth suicide, I think it's very irresponsible. And I think people like Bill Shorten and Tanya Plibersek are using LGBT people and and trying to um, create or trying to use weak mindedness for their own advantage instead of trying to promote strong mindedness, trying to promote the um, the ability to actually handle other people's opinions. I mean, I mean, Weren't, weren't they gay people once upon a time who were saying that we are strong and everything back in Stonewall, right, and wherever? Um, but right now they become all these weak-minded people who aren't able to handle opinions. So I think it's very wrong for, for Labour and for the Greens to keep, to keep pushing 
this entire um, you know homophobic rhetoric as a, this, this homophobic theme um, in, instead of actually fostering strong mindedness and allow and promoting the need to be able to handle opinions. Uh, everyone's a snowflake these days. I mean, yeah. like for example, the feminist movement was, uh, was supposed to represent, you know, strong, independent women. Now they get triggered yeah, by, exactly. by everything. I mean, the, the LGBT lobby, they're just triggered by somebody saying, I support traditional marriage. I mean, that, that, that's how easily they, they get triggered. Yeah, I mean... Uh... People do say a lot more things. I mean, we, people do say things re from, from a whole range of perspectives. It doesn't matter if they do. I mean, you say things that are offensive to Christians, for example. But do Christians get triggered? No, they don't. They they accept your opinion and they ignore it. Um, so I think they need to, the LGBT people need to learn to actually uh, to ignore or maybe maybe even discuss with people, particular stances or particular opinions, and be willing to actually um, talk with them rather than go inside the cave and um, you know start getting triggered at every single critical opinion you hear. I think that that's just a bit of a failure on your own part. I mean, you are meant to be these um, sort of sort of. I thought you were meant to be these unique individuals who are able to handle anything. Um, you made songs about it, I think. Um, but then here you are saying you're weak-minded. So I think, again, it's irresponsible. And, you know, just handle opinions. Um, and sometimes the truth hurts. I get that. But, you know, that's just a part of life. And, of course, there's been some uh, LGBT activists who have uh, called for a boycott of the vote, saying it you know, won't be uh, legitimate, they're paranoid that it's somehow rigged, uh, because apparently like they, say, they, they seem to suddenly believe that nobody ever uses the mail now. I mean, but people, even young people, you know, they still get things like you know, driver's licenses through the mail and uh, you know, bank cards. Uh, you know, so, so there is still uh, things that people uh, get through the mail, uh, and I can't stand this. Uh, you, you talked about, you know, it's important to understand we live in a democracy. They're saying, oh, we shouldn't be having, you know, uh, I refuse to participate in a vote on on my rights. Oh, well, you know, just because you say something is a right doesn't make it true. You know, we live in, in a democracy unless you're proposing, uh, you know, a dictatorship where you you decide, you know, what rights are legitimate or not. I mean, this is how we resolve issues in society. I mean, I guess we should, you know, not have the Indigenous referendum because, um, you know, that might trigger Indigenous people. Yeah, I mean, why are they pushing for the indigenous referendum if, at the same time, they're they're not pushing, they're, they're trying, they're opposing the plebiscite? Again, it just shows the hypocrisy ultimately as well. Um, you know, I mean, that's you know, that's ultimately the entire point here. Yeah, we do live in a democracy, and the postal. If you boycott the vote, then um, then that's all the better for us because that means I'm pretty sure we will win. Uh, if you don't vote in favor of your um your particular perspective or your opinion on it, then you know we will vote, and if we will win, and all the better for us. So you know, if you do that, then I won't regret that. I suppose. Yeah. I mean, if it returns a you know no vote and the and the same sex marriage crowd refuse to campaign, I mean that's going to well at least ensure that the Liberal and National Party they would never vote for same sex marriage you know for eternity because the Australian people would have rejected it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, anyway, if this decision takes place, then yeah, I mean, we'll never see, we probably never will see any decision done for a very long time, um, unless Labour gets in and Labour tries to circum subvert our democratic procedures and say, you know, this vote was rigged, therefore we will do it again, or, you know, we will have a conscience vote, but I don't think they will do that. Um, and I feel like, you know, since um, Malcolm Turnbull was willing to have this purpose that I feel like he, he now has the upper hand in the next election. I feel like he's getting the upper hand slowly, which is a good thing. Um, you know, if if you're paranoid that it's rigged, for example, then again, that, that can't be right because it, it, that, that doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Okay, I mean, we, our prime minister is a left-wing prime minister. Yeah. He, he wouldn't rig or he wouldn't see it being rigged by someone else. So I'm pretty sure you'll be fine. There won't be any rigging involved. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Malcolm Turnbull is a supporter of same-sex marriage. He said yeah. he'll campaign for the yes vote. Like, why would yeah. he design it to fail when, like, if it came back as no, that would totally humiliate Malcolm Turnbull.
Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it'll go against. It'll be like David Cameron on Brexit. I mean, he gave the Brexit referendum and he voted. Well, he supported um, Remain, um, but Brexit won. So you know, it might be like that. You know, but Remain didn't win, did it? No, it didn't. Um, Brexit didn't win because it was rigged. Despite David Cameron was in, in in Remain. So I think same logic applies here. You know, Malcolm Turnbull is um, is a left wing prime minister. Well, and while this isn't our our, well, it, this isn't my preference to have a plebiscite. I would rather keep the definition like this. It's better than you know having a conscience vote or a free vote in parliament where the people, where the, where the representatives may not necessarily be speaking for the people. I mean, this marriage has been this, the definition everywhere, almost everywhere in the world for thousands of years, for millennia. Um, and this is a huge radical change. And if you don't think a democratic vote is necessary if you think a free vote is important, then that's just quite irresponsible. So you know, I'm I'm glad um, that we are getting the plebiscite side and it's not a free vote. Yeah, the institution of marriage it doesn't belong to the government; it belongs to all Australians. And so it's only fair that you know Australians should have a say in how you know marriage is defined. And if they vote that they want to allow same-sex couples to get married, then I would accept that result. Yeah, I mean, I I have seen many people who um who I thought were quite conservative who actually support same-sex marriage. So, for example, um yeah, that that scares me actually. For example, um last week I saw Rita Panahi say, um you know I I I am for same-sex marriage. I personally support same-sex marriage. However, I think a public side is important. Um, I never knew she was for same-sex marriage. I know um Avi Yamini, for example, today um made or yesterday or today made a video um saying. I'm not religious, you know. I I don't I don't have anything to do with religion. I'm secular. I'm atheist, so therefore I support um, their right to get married. You know, that so people who I thought were conservative in many ways they support it, and that worries me as well. So I mean, if anyone should, needs to be worried, it's us. I think it's it's our side who needs to be worried. I mean, if we have people who are conservative in this day and age who are for it, then I'm pretty sure the for side or the yes side is is all set. Um, so what? So I am the one who's worried. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if the polls are, you know, correct, then the pro same sex marriage side will get up, and you know that that's. I mean, they've the traditional marriage people. They could have easily said, you know, no, we're you know not going to ha- have a plebiscite and you know risk l- losing. This has been put forward as okay, you know, let's resolve this issue by the yeah. you know uh, most legitimate means possible. Yeah, I mean, we were prepared. The the Tony Abbott people who are you know um, who are conservative who do not do not support it, we were prepared to come into the middle. You know, meet you halfway and say, okay, we will um, disregard our belief that marriage should be defined by religion. We will we will tell you that oh, you know we we will we will we, we will come to some sort of uh, agreements. We are prepared. We are prepared to depart from our traditional beliefs um, that there should be no change and come to an agreement and maybe have a plebiscite. You're not prepared to do the same. I mean, you should be prepared to do the same. Okay, politics is in many in many ways it's about concessions. Okay, and it's coming. It's about coming into the middle in many ways. Um, so in this case, we have done our part. We have done our bit. I think it's your turn, um, the yes side, to do your part and say, okay, you have you know you have departed from your beliefs. We can we can too. We are strong minded. We can be strong minded. We can depart from our beliefs and meet you halfway. And speaking of polls, um. I just want to raise the again fake news, fake fake news media. I just want to raise how um, what it looks like. Channel Nine. I'm not sure exactly, but it looks like Channel Nine has um, rigged the polls um, and said 88. I think it was eight, above 80 percent of people support supported. But if you look at the actual numbers of people who voted in the poll, um, it says you know, it's much lower. The people who said yes are much lower. I think it's about three times um, lower than the people who said no, except they are saying there's an 88% of support for same-sex marriage. Um, so just, just throwing it in there, some you know fake news shenanigans in this situation. Oh, well, web polls, like where anyone can vote, I hardly think they're, they're scientific, which is why we're uh, not basing the results uh, on whether we decide same-sex marriage is legal based on polling. Yeah, and they're rigged. I mean, I mean, they can be easily rigged by the people who made them as well. So yeah. Okay, so let's move on to our next topic now, which is electricity prices. Now, uh, they're re- uh, they're starting to get really high in uh, a lot of Australian states. I mean, there there were. 
there was a, a graphic that showed that Australian states have some of the most uh, have some some of the highest uh, power price prices in the developed world. Now, they the government held this meeting with uh, uh, electricity retailers to you know find ways to you know stop these high prices. The retailers uh, blame the government for uncertainty uh, over not adopting the uh, clean energy target, which was a recommendation of the Finkel Climate Review. So, so basically, the energy retailers are saying it's because you're not incentivizing us to invest in more renewable energy. The reason. Uh, why power prices are rising, which I, I interpret as that uh, these energy retailers, they, they basically want uh, to make sure the, go uh, the, the government's going to grant them, you know, more subsidies uh, so, uh, so they can, you know, rent seek more. That seems to be what they're after. Yeah, I think we all know why the power prices are high. And I'm, I'm not surprised that people are trying to... Um, trying to prevent society from turning turning um, against um, renewable energy after these results because I'm, they, I'm pretty sure they would expect society to finally realize that renewable energy is not having a very good impact on our country and so they're obviously trying to say you know we need more subsidies. I read on um, news.com.au today an, an article saying um, by a particular I think it was a minister in South Australia saying um, the the higher prices mean that we must now switch to solar energy uh, and I was like what you know that doesn't make sense you know we all know that um, a departure from coal from traditional sources of energy, which, which in many ways are not harmful to the environment at all, um, are the real causes of this. So you know, it's quite rich for you to, for you to keep asking for renewables. You're only making it hard for, hard for your own side, um, and people are going to only keep turning against your um, renewable energy when you keep promoting it, despite the evidence that shows that renewable energy does not work. Yeah, I mean, the the, the whole point of you know, policies such as the carbon tax and renewable energy target was to, you know, raise the, the price of coal-fired power. I mean, this was the whole idea to, you know, yeah. raise uh, power prices. I mean, and so it's a bit rich now of the, the left to complain we need to do something about, uh, you know, energy affordability. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so, like, you know, this, this is what you wanted. I mean, what did you think would happen when you, you know, closed down, you know, all the power stations in South Australia and Hazelwood and Victoria? Like, pff, yeah. I mean, when I read the ABC news articles and the, well, the mainstream news articles, they were almost implying that, you know, this is thanks to the Liberals, you know, the Liberals aren't doing enough when it comes to energy prices. I mean, you wanted to increase the price of energy. You, you wanted to impose renewable energy into this country and you want to imp you want to impose taxes, artificial taxes, artificial price increases um, into the renewable, into the energy sector. And here you are going through the results and now here you are um, having the nerve, you have the nerve to actually blame imply that the government isn't doing enough. Well, the government is doing what you're asking them to do. The government is giving you what you, what you the left, want. Um, but you are telling us that the government isn't doing enough and you you seem to be surprised by these results. Well, you know, you asked for it. Um, that was the whole idea of, you know, raising energy prices to actually reduce energy use um, to, you know, for climate change. And now you face the consequences. Um, so I think, you know, again, take some responsibility this time at least. Yeah, and it's not just like power prices going up. It's not just you know numbers. Like it has an, a, an actual effect on you know real people. The a lot of the media they've been you know visiting Australians who are living in energy poverty. I mean they don't take showers at their their home. They go to you know public places. They you know f to, don't turn turn the heater on on at all. Yeah. Like it, like it's actually like people you know are really struggling, and this shouldn't happen in Australia, which has yeah. uh, an abundance of energy, and you know. This just comes weeks after uh, Craig Kelly, a government backbencher, was you know ridiculed for saying you know people will die because they they can't afford to turn on the heater. Well, look at the conditions that people are living in. Yeah, again, I mean, I we once I think it was last year we said that these policies were only there for the inner city leftist elites, for the inner city leftist elites, and they were there to try and appeal to them. Well, we were right, okay, because now the evidence, the consequences show that the, the, the normal people, ordinary people, are having to suffer, while the rich um, elite 
lefties in the inner west in Sydney or some or wherever you know the inner, inner city areas in, in, our, in, in our country, they are they think they've done something so noble. They think they've done something so good by imposing these um, these costs and prices on energy while ordinary people are going through these problems. I mean, this is winter. It's very hard to, you know, to, to live without heaters or without hot showers during this particular season. Um, so, you know, ultimately the blame, the, bla the blame should be laid on you for making people go through these thanks to your regressive policies. And is it really worth, like, you know, these middle upper class lefties, like, you know, is it, is it really worth you to get, you know, some smug satisfaction by thinking you're saving the earth and you yeah. know, letting all the, you know, poor people that you, uh, you know, supposedly care about, you know, wallow in, you know, squalid living conditions? Like, I thought you were, like, is this what you want? Yeah, I mean, isn't left wasn't left for the working people in the first place? I mean, wasn't wasn't the main base of the left usually the working people? That's what I thought for, from their revolutions. Uh, but it turns out no, they they become they become sort of gentrified. You know, the left has become gentrified. It seems in many ways because they're not attracting, they're not appealing, they're not they're not actually looking at or examining the, their base. Um, and that's one reason why establishment politicians are going down these days, and you know, alternative parties are going up. Um, but that's a, that's a different point. Um, you know, as, I, I just want to say, you know, as you mentioned before, Aust this shouldn't be happening in Australia. And you know, I think you are basing you are basing your entire policies on these on these vague on these vague policies that say that there can, there may be a man made um there, there may be a contribution of man made behavior of human behavior to climate change well the thing is the studies actually say, say that um many studies actually say that climate change has been happening since forever. Many don't say that there is a particular connection. And the studies that do say that there is a the connection between human behavior and climate change, they say it's a combination of man-made and natural causes, meaning that it doesn't matter what you do. Okay, if climate change is happening, it's going to happen someday. All, you do, all you're doing is slowing it down. And all you are doing is instead of examining it head, head first, you are, you, are, you are condemning the future generations to handle it. Okay, I mean, you're doing the exact same thing. Assuming climate change is real, since human behavior and nature both have contribution, you're just slowing it down. You are not actually tackling climate change head fast, assuming it exists. Um, and you are, you know, you are telling that we need to slow it down so that the future generations, our children, will solve it while we are in the grave and don't suffer from it. Yeah, uh, well, it's not too late to reverse uh, all this, you know, climate madness. I mean, uh, if uh, Turnbull wanted to take a another brave decision, I mean, like he stuck with the plebiscite that was brave enough. If he wanted to, you know, to do another one, he would, you know, say, you know, we're going to stop this, you know, renewable energy target. You know, where we're going to, you know, start, you know, building coal-fired power stations as well. And you know, you lefties and greenies, you can just, you know, suck it up because the people want lower power prices. Yeah, imagine imagine the, the outrage if we did that. Imagine the protests in the streets if we did that. That would be that would be very um quite hilarious. Um but yeah if he really wants to well he's done a lot. I'll give him that. He's done a lot um with the plebiscite for example. But if he wants to go a step further, you know, a step further, um then he can actually say that, you know what, we're not gonna listen to these UN. We're not gonna listen to these people who want to control us um and tell us that that this particular thing is happening, you know, we're going to do what's best for our country and maybe use some logic and reasoning rather than using some results given by these far-flung scientists from, from Geneva or Switzerland or somewhere exotic, um, and we're going to do, do something useful. Um, and if he does that, that, if he does that, that'll be good. And maybe if he wants to actually um, do something about supposed climate change, maybe he can actually promote innovation. I mean, innovation is the best way um, to to solve problems, even, I mean, even if climate change wasn't real, okay, even if it, if it, I mean, if it, even if it wasn't real at all, innovation is still a good thing. Um, so I think if you want, if you really want to solve it, maybe focus on things like nuclear energy, for example. Um, we have an, we have a, an abundance of such resources in this country, so focusing on those resources will be will be very useful. And people will say, but those aren't safe. Well, actually, they're not safe if you don't build them properly. And right now, they have actually been developed and advanced, and we don't. Have have earthquakes here anyway um so they are you know in a place like australia they are they can be quite safe so i think if you want to go a step further um stop this madness and 
you know, re revive our coal energy tradition. And if you want to look at nuclear energy or some other more innovative energy source to make things better for everyone. Uh, nuclear is a far too uh, efficient energy source for you know environmentalists to consider. They only want you know unreliable solar and wind. It seems like yeah, so, which 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 is the reason why we think that you know they're anti-progress because they seem to choose the worst option every yeah. time. But we should move on to our next topic now, which is Sydney's homeless tent city, uh, which is in Sydney's Martin Place, which is, I mean, Suk, if you're from yeah. Sydney, so you've probably yeah. got a better idea of yeah. the uh, uh, of what Martin Place is like. So can you describe it to us? Yeah, I was actually there um, on Tuesday. I was there on Tuesday in Martin Place, and it, it was just like what the news was showing it to be. Um, you know, Oh, it was what I, what I was expecting in many ways. Um, it was quite it was quite disheartening to see people out there in the cold. But then when you realize what's actually happening beneath, what's actually happening in secret, then you are sort of um, so, so you, you sort of open up and you realize that you know this is kind of this, this is a bit of a this is a bit of a a, a, a stunt. It, it looks like a stunt. Um, and when you go there, while it is disheartening, I didn't really feel much compassion or much sympathy for some reason. I don't, I don't like saying this, but I didn't really feel much sympathy. Um, I just felt, I just felt, you know, yeah, it's, it's a bad thing, but you know, I'm pretty sure there's something behind all this. Yeah. I mean, they've been there uh, since, oh, we've, uh, I found out during my research since December 2016. So they've been there for quite a while, but it's really come to a head in the, the past week. The state uh, state coalition government now want it removed. Uh, Clover Moore, probably because she f feels that this is a way to embarrass the state government, has you know, done nothing. Don't get us started on uh, Clover Moore. And uh, they've... The media, mainstream media, to its credit, um, uh, has you know dug a bit deeper in this situation and found that you know these uh, alleged homeless people they've rejected accommodation because it was only temporary. They will only accept permanent housing, and many of them actually earn too much money and are not even Australian citizens. There was an interesting confrontation between the housing minister Prue Goward, who you know was trying to be you know very dip diplomatic as possible also with the unofficial mayor of the tent city, uh, Lance Priestley, who is actually a New Zealand citizen. He's a father of uh, 12 children and it was just revealed today in The Australian that he has a you know, violent criminal past. He, he was also there when you know, Occupy Sydney happened. So uh, you know, n not the you know, most noble uh, person. Like, he was basically, you know, uh, Prigal was trying was trying to you know be offering as much help as possible and it was there there's one part where uh, Prigal says you know we can help them out with Centrelink benefits and uh, Lance Priestley says how can they cook with Centrelink benefits it's like <laughs> well, like if these demands are completely unreasonable like they they you know they're offering you know the state government's offering you know the you know free accommodation, uh, but you're upset because it's you know not temporary, uh, so, sorry not permanent, and so you're you know you're happy to you know remain out on the street, and he's you know you're demanding like people cook for you. I mean like. There, there's so many other people who, um, you know, are doing are doing it tough, who are living in poverty. I mean, and who don't. Uh, you know, have the or think of the creative ability to pull off a media stunt like this. Everyone's doing it tough. You know, why should you be entitled to you know greater benefits because you know you you want to you know create this you know chaos in the center of Sydney? I mean, if you already earn money, and you know, if you're not Australian citizens, then you don't really have you don't really have a good argument in the first place. I mean, you're not you don't really have valid point in the first place um just firstly secondly you i mean it's i think it's i i do think it's a bit um too much for them to expect people expect society to help them i think you know i i am a big believer in personal responsibility um i believe in karma so you know i think it's it's a bit it's a, it's a bit too much to expect society to do something from for you when you should be doing it for yourself um and th the, the the truth is you, you do seem to be doing things for yourself in secret um you do seem to be earning money except you can you you keep asking for more um just like all the other left-wing uh, 
victim group to keep asking for more, for more. and the gov- the New South Wales government has given you um, something, something, and, but then you keep rejecting that. Now I'm happy that um, our our premier Gladys Berejiklian has actually said that we will remove um, these people. We will pass laws to remove them from this and area. Physically um, remove. Physically remove. Yes, exactly. She's gone. She's gone full Pinochet. Hopefully, that's 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 too good to be true. But you know, she physically removed because that's it's very bad for tourism. There are tourists in that area. Um, you know, we have the, we have, we do still have the highest amount of tourists who come to this country. Country, um, and they and you know there are tourists walking in that area in Martin Place, and it's going to be a huge embarrassment for this entire country. It's going to be showed around the world, and therefore I think it's best to remo- remove them because it's an embarrassment. Yeah, I mean, the state government has been, you know, very patient with them, you know, tried to, you know, accommodate all their, you know, unreasonable uh, demands. Um, but yeah, they've, they've, Gladys Berejiklian has clearly, you know, had enough. And yeah. it's clear that uh, the public is awake to the fact that this has all the hallmarks of a, you know, a leftist stunt, which is, you know, designed to, you know, shame a, you know, conservative state government. I mean, you know, we learned that this Lance Priestley guy, you know, is a professional uh, leftist uh, protester. And, yeah. uh, and they're, they're, you know, where did they, you know, get the, the tents from? Uh, that's what a lot of people have been pointing out. You know, they're very uh, resourceful for, yeah, for a bunch exactly. of home, homeless people. And, and it seems to be they've only sucked in the usual lefties. I mean, Sam Dastyari did a Facebook video uh, from uh, from Martin Place saying, "Oh, you know how horrible is this? You know, f- uh, f- homeless crisis where it, you know he just you know looks like a cuck." Uh, I, I think the public are, are seeing through you know the because they they're always doing things in in the middle of. Uh, uh, major cities, you know, these leftist groups, but, um, you know, they, they, they don't seem to, uh, like they, they obviously try, they're, they're not trying to convince the public. They're trying to intimidate and they're, they're finding that their tax tactics are not working as well as they used to. Yeah, and if we, the, the, uh, you mentioned the tent thing, where do they get tents from? That's a very good point. Because real homeless people do not have tents. I've seen real homeless people; they don't, they don't, they do not carry tents with them. Um, they, they don't have tents. They, they, they just have a few blankets, and that's it. Um, so again, the, the, the tents actually show that those are they're just props that they show that they're actually been fu- probably been funded by someone else. Um, and as you mentioned, he's a he's a professional leftist protester who who does get paid for protesting. Um, so is there, there's really nothing more to be said um, other than the fact that this is a stunt, it's not real, and we shouldn't really pay attention to it. And we should we should physically remove them. And I'm happy, I'm happy Gladys chose to do that. I didn't know she would. I'm happy she did because that's the right thing to do. I mean, even when you have the, the mainstream media, you know, doubting your, you know, sob story, then you've got problems. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That, that's that, that's the biggest point here. I mean, the, even the mainstream media um, doesn't believe you. I think that sort of says something. Um, unless or else they'll be all over you, but they're not. Um, so I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy that you know they're not resorting to fake news this time, at least. Yeah, and, and definitely, I think the public are on Gladys's side when she's you know yeah. said enough is enough. There, they've got to go. Yeah. Now let's go overseas to. Um, or which uh, we should say geopolitics, which has been dominated this week by uh, Trump and North Korea. Now, um, Trump is, he's, he's clearly had enough of uh, the uh, threats by the North Koreans. He said that the US respond will with uh, fire and fury like the, the world has never seen before. Uh, North Korea has responded that they can hit the, the US island of, of Guam. Uh, now, the, the rhetoric between the two nations has increased quite a lot since uh, Trump took, uh, took office. And of course, the lefties would say, oh, this is because Trump is a hothead, you know, just like uh, uh, Kim Jong-sun. Um, but uh, it's North Korea, they're, they're over the... Over the year, they've had a series of uh, successful and unsuccessful missile launches. I mean, they've been a rogue state for a number of years, but most of the media is now saying this is different, and you know, we should. This is like really cause for concern, and we should be nervous. You know, what do you think? 
Um, well, well, firstly, I mean, I do sometimes agree that Trump can be a bit irrational when it comes for, when it comes to anything. I think he does have that side. Um, with the Syria bombings, for example, it was something very sudden, unexpected, and we were quite disappointed with that, and it did seem quite irrational. But in this particular circumstance, I feel like the left is going a bit too far by saying he's a hothead, he'll do anything. Um, I don't think he will. Um, I don't think he'll actually go and bomb North Korea and nuke them. Well, he wouldn't nuke them. He, I, I don't think I'll be. He, I'll think he'd be a bit more um, cautious because North Korea still ultimately has China. I mean, we're not we're not exactly sure whose side China is on. China is definitely annoyed by North Korea, but China may not like it if America comes in and does something. Um, so we're not exactly sure what China wants to. Uh, so I think um, right now I don't think anything bad will happen. I, do not think there's going to be a huge nuclear showdown to showdown or anything. Um, I just, I'm actually waiting for something to happen. You know, I'm, I've been so sick of this entire thing. It's been happening for years. Um, so, you know, maybe it's be- better if they, if America does go in and does something um, and tries to take it down because this person is not only bad for America, he's bad for other surrounding countries as well, like Japan, China, South Korea. They're all, they're all living in, in fear thanks to, thanks to him. Um, and don't forget, his people in his own country are suffering. So I think um, I, 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 I am a bit of an isolationist, but in this particular circumstance, maybe intervention is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, North Korea, let's remember, it's only a nation of, you know, 20 million people, or, or should I say hostages? I mean, all they yeah. really want is to be fed. I mean, they're, they're not fanatics. I mean, they're living yeah. under a brutal Stalinist uh, dictatorship. So it would be much easier to engage in regime change in North Korea than it would be, you know, somewhere like Syria. Um, yeah, but the question is, like, would, if the regime was to change, uh, would that result in a nuclear showdown? And we, well, we've seen North Korea's nuclear tests this year that a lot of them haven't gone according to plan. So, you know, would they really be, be able to, to do much damage it is the question, which is why, you know, I'm not really, you know, shaking in my big boots, even though there's a lot of uh, people in the, the media and the um, geopolitical community saying, oh, this is, you know, really nerve wracking stuff. But yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah. And uh, let, let's not forget that, you know, Trump isn't exactly, you know, freelancing on this. I mean, he would be consulting, you know, his yeah. generals and the um, yeah. Uh, State Department, Defense Department, and and he said that you know he and his administration are all at uh, one with North Korea. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. This isn't Syria, you know. This is North. This is a, this is a different place with, with actual um, nuclear weapons. So I wouldn't say Trump would just make his own decision. Um, he would consult with everyone, even with the Congress, before he does something, um, because it's something that concerns all of them, um, and because of the because of the nuclear nature of this particular problem. Um, we do have technology that can prevent missiles from actually crashing, so I'm not exactly worried. I do, I do not think that the missiles can reach Sydney or Melbourne. So, in, from, from a selfish perspective, I not, I'm not really worried at all. Um, I'm pretty sure they can reach the the west coast of um, the United States, and that that's quite alarming. Again, however, we do have technology that can prevent this um, from happening. So I think in, in if something does happen, then, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that's going to be a problem. And if, I don't think North Korea would be dumb enough to do that. I mean, the leadership is quite smart in many ways. They are clever. They can be clever. Um, not not nice people, but they're clever. And I, if North Korea does something, I don't think they're prepared for the consequences. Um, if they do something, then it'll be obliterated. Um, I'm pretty sure they want to survive, um, so they wouldn't really do something irrational. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, the regime still wants to survive. I don't think they, they you know, deep down want to, you know, cause a doomsday. I, I, I mean everyone you know still wants the the will to live um and and i think most people like i'm a non-interventionist like you but uh, i do think that if we can you know rescue these 20 million people from this regime and stop the um you know the the asian region being you know so unstable it would be yeah. you know, worth it if if the if the us could just go uh, go, go in hard and then you know wipe it out and then it's all over and we can just move on. But it's, yeah, it's a very delicate uh, situation.
It is, yeah. I mean, it's a bit like it's a bit like saying ISIS. You know, um, ISIS is a global threat. Um, there are people who are saying Middle Eastern wars are Middle Eastern problems. We understand that, um, but ISIS is not just a Middle Eastern problem. I mean, they, they want to take over the world and they want to actually expand the caliphate. Um, countries like India are right next to the, the Middle East. Uh, and that's a huge problem. Countries like Russia, countries like Egypt, for example, they're right next to them and. It's quite risky, ISIS, and Europe, Turkey, Europe, right there. Um, same thing with North Korea. You know, their nuclear weapons have a global impact. So, and of course, let's not forget the 20 million people. So, I think in this particular circumstance, intervention by by a country like the United States um, is good if it's necessary, if it's needed. And, and we have to point out that you know Trump is. Uh, a lot smarter on you know foreign policy than a lot of people are uh, giving credit for. I mean, the, we were all quite you know disappointed when the Syria strike uh, happened, but you know there there was uh, there was this narrative that it was part of a you know five D chess move oh, yeah. to to, uh, to basically get heat off the the Russia story and make it look like you know, he was taking uh, decisive action. So you know we shouldn't. Uh, uh, we shouldn't underestimate him, and you know he he might he might be doing, uh, you know, a, ha, have an overall plan behind this. Let, let's not re- remember this is you know the the deal maker who's you know done neg- thousands of negotiations you know over his business career. I'll bet you know the none of them have ever in, never involved nuclear weapons, but yeah, yeah, we you know we're you know pro Trump people. I mean, we have faith that you know he knows uh, knows what he's doing here. Yeah, and you just mentioned the Russia um, conspiracy, and I just want to refer to the mainstream media's response to this, um, and just just raise the the inconsistencies between their responses to this and the response to the Syria strikes. Um, so when Trump went to Syria, they loved it. I mean, they they they, they, they loved it, um, and they said this is the day I, he became our president, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is beautiful. I love seeing this. CNN was saying that. That was when he made an actual irrational decision, well, what seemed to be a sudden irrational decision um, that didn't really have any congressional approval, and CNN loved it. You know, it was a sudden decision, they loved it, but now, now this time, when Trump is using the fire and fury rhetoric, and when Trump is, um, you know, tr- sort of tr- trying to respond to North Korea, CNN is saying, this is bad. Um, this is going to re- wreak havoc in the region. It's going to make things dangerous. I mean, inconsistencies are quite interesting. When Trump did a sudden action on Syria, you loved it. But now when Trump is trying to do something else in North Korea, you don't seem to like it. Um, so that's just an interesting thing I saw during this particular situation. Uh, maybe because North Korea is communist, the the, the mainstream media maybe. like it more. Maybe, 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 yeah. Maybe they don't like seeing the last true communist country go down um, if Trump goes in there. Oh well, that's all we've got time for this week. So thank you once again, Sukith, for being my co-host. It was my pleasure. And I'd also t- uh, t- like to take this opportunity to remind uh, our listeners and viewers of The Unshackled that I'll be in New Zealand uh, next month to cover their uh, general election, which is on uh, Saturday, uh, September the 23rd. So while I'm in New Zealand, I'll be posting election updates. Uh, we'll be doing videos from the ground, and also I'll be hosting an election night coverage with uh, some of our friends over at uh, Right Minds New Zealand. We've already increased our coverage of New Zealand politics. You, know, you will have noticed uh, in the lead up, it's, it's shaping up to be uh, quite, quite an interesting uh, election. We thought the uh, right was in the ascendancy, but uh, the New Zealand Labour Party have got a new leader who has uh, shot up in popularity, which is uh, quite concerning. But we will uh, bring you increased coverage of when New Zealand goes to the polls. Uh, At the end of the show, the usual reminders apply. If you haven't yet signed up to the email list at theunshackled.net slash subscribe, please consider coming a patron of The Unshackled on Patreon. We've arranged some awesome benefits for our supporters. And don't forget there's Unshackled merchandise on sale at uprightmarket.com. And also don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. You can do so on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to keep checking the unshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time.